What is up, everyone? Welcome back to the Fitness Stuff for Normal People podcast. I'm Tony. And I'm Mariana. And right now, the fitness industry, it kind of sucks. It really sucks. It's become something built on just anything that can drive clicks and nothing that really matters where we're just trying to provide you with the knowledge and tools to give you the confidence and actually applying the best possible training and nutrition into your own life where today we are going to take you through exactly what you need to do to build the strongest and most well-developed glutes possible because building strong glutes isn't just for turning heads yes they look dope on guys or girls but they're also arguably the most important muscle group when it comes to your actual health they are the biggest muscle in your core, meaning if they're deconditioned, your lower back, your hips, and other leg muscles are going to need to overcompensate to cover up that, leading to countless problems down the road. They're also pound for pound the best muscle you could do to improve your overall metabolic rate, and having strong glutes will make almost every other exercise in the gym stronger, not just lower body movements like squats and deadlifts, but upper body movements like bench press, overhead press, and rowing. Today, we're going to take you through exactly how to build your training split to prioritize glute development from exercise choice to how many days per week you need to be training them, along with how to set up your diet because, spoiler alert, no one's ever grown solid glutes living in a calorie deficit. And coming out with today's episode, we are dropping two, not just one, but two brand new 12-week training programs over on FS Premium, which, reminder, you get access to all the programs, including this one for just five bucks a month over there. But today we're going to launch two different variations on an upper lower body split. Both are designed for either four or five days per week. One is prioritizing glute growth and development, hitting lower body three times per week. And the other is for upper body development for those who really want to develop their delts, chest, back, and arms a little bit more. These programs include detailed micro and meso phases working on both strength and size, all programmed out onto Google Sheets so you can track every detail of your training on your phone to almost guarantee that you're making progress if your nutrition is lined up. Again, these are these programs, like all of our others, are free to all premium members, and that is only five bucks a month to be a part of. The link to that is down in the show notes below. And if you want to support us, the best way you could do so is by giving us a five-star rating wherever you are listening. You can also go ahead and follow us on Spotify so that you stay up to date on every new episode we drop on Mondays. And before we get into it, a quick note from our sponsors from day one, Legion Athletics. If you need to re-up on your pre-workout, your protein powder, some of your supplements, staple supplements like fish oils, one I highly recommend. They also have a good probiotic now. You can use our code FSPOD to get 20% off your first order or double points on every order after that. One of the reasons why I'm like always recommending Legion specifically their whey protein isolate is for people who really struggle with digesting protein powders. So it actually contains no lactose and it's readily digested and absorbed. So it's really great for people who tend to struggle with digestion of protein powders. It's one of the purest forms of way you can get so Mm -hmm. highly recommend as an ibs girly like definitely always recommend this one to people with stomach issues and protein powders it's the first one that hasn't bothered my stomach for real i talk about it all the time but usually one or two shakes a day would screw my gut up and Mm -hmm. this is the first one that just feels regular feels nice yeah and i'm not even lactose intolerant or anything that's the weird part (sighs) Let's talk about your butt. Today, we are breaking down everything glutes because we, I mean, this has been, this is what, 100 plus episodes in, and we haven't had an episode completely dedicated to this yet, which I'm a little shocked we haven't just because of how hot of a topic they are. And even if you're not Mm -hmm. going through the 12 week programs that we're coming out with, the goal of today's episode is to give you every last detail on how to grow and develop the best glutes possible. We set this episode into three specific portions, I guess. We'll break it down. Part one is kind of like we do with every episode. We have to understand what we're talking about first before going into it. So part one is going to be just understanding the glutes, talking about the different muscles, the anatomy, and their function before going into part two, which is going to be every last detail of building out workouts and the training side of things from choosing the right exercises, picking how many days per week you need to train them to the right set and rep schemes. The whole nine yards, which finishing off, we then go into part three, which is underrated when it comes to glute development, I think, at least when I see talking about it online, which is the nutrition and recovery aspect. Because as my friend 
who I talked to in building this episode, her name's Masha. She's an IFBB bikini pro, one of the best female glute coaches I know. One of her biggest pieces of advice, or, or I guess lessons she's had, is she just says you cannot expect to grow your glutes living in a calorie deficit year round. And I feel like whenever you see talk about glute growth on social media, they never talk about nutrition. Yeah, It's just something like what's the best exercise, the most optimal thing you could do in the gym, but mm -hmm. they skip over the nutrition part. Yeah. I think more and more though, lately, at least the people I follow. So, so I really have to put my perspective into our audience sometimes. So I'll even go on social media and just on TikTok and search the hashtag like fitness or hashtag like glute growth. Cause my for you page is very filtered of a lot of toxicity at this point. Mm -hmm. So I do that to kind of get an idea of what general people are seeing often. And it's so lacking in the glute department of nutrition, but a lot of the girls I follow, I've noticed more and more like this past year talking about how you want to glow your glutes, but you're not eating enough, period. You cannot expect to grow anything without enough yeah. fuel. So I've been yeah, seeing it more, like, but. Yeah, more and more. I think you're right. It is coming out, especially I, I see a lot of female coaches who do an awesome job that have gone through it because we're going to talk a lot about glute genetics, which is a massive factor in determining how your glutes look. But the girls who have gone from having seemingly no glutes to have grown really strong, well-developed glutes, when they talk through it every single time, they talk about the nutrition piece and how they could mm. not have gotten from point A yeah. to point B without it. So we're going to go into that too. And I wanted to give a quick shout out to, I mean, really the pioneer of glute development. I've got his book right here, Brett Contreras, the glute lab book, which if you're <laughs> seeing this right now, I brought it up. I, I shout it out over and over again. Not only just the best book I've read on everything glutes, but I think one of the best overall books you could read period on muscle growth and hypertrophy, just muscle growth period and hypertrophy. I mean, if you don't know who he is, this dude literally invented the hip thrust. You know, that exercise that everyone talks about for growing the best glutes. He invented it. There was no hip thrust. Brett Contreras came along. Then there was a hip, like he invented it, which I think is a funny thing to kind of throw in there. Cause who's the last person to invent a compound movement, but he's got several gyms and he's written hundreds of articles online and can attributed to, I mean, I tried to tally them up, but countless published research papers and reviews on glute development, strength training, hypertrophy, perfect mix. I think of science and practice, which we talk about all the time, which I think is like a, an, I'd say like a flaw in the evidence-based side of things is there's how the book says it's done. And then there's the, in the trenches, the going mm -hmm. through it, the, in the practice, because those two things don't always align. So he's done one of the best jobs, I think, of combining both of those in practice with thousands of clients, but also publishing countless research papers. I think it's really, really cool. So let's start off right here with part number one, which is going to be understanding the glutes. So your glutes are composed of three primary muscles. It's not just one thing. You have the gluteus maximus or the glute max, the gluteus medius or the glute med, and the gluteus minimus the glute men. And usually the men and the mead are kind of grouped together because they have similar attachment points in there anatomically, like right on top of each other. But there's three different heads and they all have very specific functions. But before we go into the anatomy of it, I think it's important to note is to highlight and remind you that you should always base your training strategy around your individual goals and select exercises based on your individual anatomy because people are different. We talk about that all the time. And there's some differences between both male and female hip anatomy, but not even just male or female, but just person to person differences in hip width, femur length, sp natural spine arc, all these things that we're going to get into just a little bit later that are going to make certain exercises a lot better or more advantageous for one person than it will another. And what we'll do <laughs> is even later, we're going to sample through like for you or Mariana over here, how we would build and choose exercises based on her anatomy. So you can kind of understand the reasoning of why we do what we do, but mm -hmm. a quick breakdown of the three different muscles that make up your glutes, starting off with the glute max. Now the glute max is the largest and most superficial part of your glutes. It's what gives your glutes shape for the most part and is typically broken down even into subdivisions the upper and lower glute max. So it's one muscle, but broken up into upper and lower subdivisions. Like for example, if you want to target the more upper subdivision, 
what's usually referred to as like the quote unquote, like the shelf. We're going to use some also funny words to describe this some less professional, but I think that's because it's what more people understand. Like the shelf, for example, that's not an anatomical that's what, term. For normal people. <laughs> for, yeah, for, for normal yeah. people. If you want a shelf ass, like this is what we're talking about. It makes sense. <laughs> I forget. Thank you for the reminder. But things that will better target that are more like hip abduction exercises, where if you want to target more of the lower glute max, exercises like squats and deadlifts tend to be a little bit better or hip thrusting movements, which do a good job at targeting both. Moving on from the glute max, you have the glute med, which is one of my favorite and I think most forgotten about muscles in the body. But the glute med and the glute min, they're referred to as the smaller glute muscles because the glute max makes up about two thirds of all glute tissue. And one third is now split between the glute min and med. But the glute med is usually referred to as like the upper outside part of your glutes. Like when people are like, how do I grow that upper outside part of my glutes? That's usually referred to as your glute med or medius. But it's also one of the most important heads in any style of athletic training because it has so much to do with stabilization movements. And I think I told this story one time about Ryan Flaherty, who I don't know if he still currently is, but years ago was the head athletic trainer for Nike. Like mm. swoosh, just do it. I'm talking, he worked with Serena Williams, Pat Mahomes, Tom Brady, like the, the biggest athletes in the freaking world. His nickname's the Savant of Speed because his specializations in uh, track and field with sprinters. Savant of Speed, I like that. But he even created one of my favorite glute med warmups that he'd have every single athlete do before every single practice called seven way hips, which we're going to mm -hmm. include later. It's in our glute program too. Burns like a mother freaker, but is one of the most, I think the most underrated exercises to help activate your glute med, especially for any athletic performance. So we're going to talk about activation exercises like that later. And then you have the glute min, which is the smallest of the glute muscles and is located underneath the glute Mead. And again, it usually gets lumped together with the glute med because it shares the same insertion points and performs similar movements. Now, when we talk about what the function of your glutes are in each different head, they do a lot. Like your glutes are responsible for a lot. Brett Contreras refers to them as the Swiss army knife when it comes to muscles because it can handle such a wide range of actions from daily movements like walking, standing up from a chair picking something up off the ground and carrying groceries to more athletic movements like running, cutting, lifting, jumping, throwing, and striking. And because of that, it's going to be best to target your glutes from a lot of different angles, what we're going to talk about in the training part, which is, I think, unlike a lot of other muscle groups, like think of your bicep, which isn't really responsible for that many things, right? There's really two main functions of your bicep and not countless when it comes to yeah. your glutes. And that goes with a lot of different muscle groups in the body, I think probably also just where glutes are positioned in your body, like right in the center of your upper and lower body, pretty much. There's yeah. a lot that goes in, that go into them, but I think a Swiss army knife is a good way to think about it. You can think of it like your shoulder joint as well. Like your, shul your shoulder joint, your joints mm. dictate how much movement you're going to have around that that plane in your body. And so a ball and socket joint has a lot of different options for movement. You can rotate it, you can flex and extend it, you can internally and externally rotate it. Versus if you're thinking about just your elbow, you can flex and extend. You can't, same with your knee, you can't really move it other than flexion and extension. So the muscles that are attached to those ball and socket joints, and that are really the prime movers for moving them about that plane, those are going to have the most function. So it's, like you think about your shoulder has a lot of shoulder muscles have a lot of different functions as well. Very true. Actually, that's a good way to look at it. Mm -hmm. Your shoulders are like the glutes of your upper, <laughs> upper body, <Yeah. laughs> which they kind of are. I feel like guys chase more delt development and shoulder development where girls chase more yeah. glutes. Cool people chase them both. But we're going to talk about three specific joint actions that the glutes are really responsible for. And there's a, a few more, but three main ones that the glutes are responsible for hip extension, hip abduction, and hip external rotation, which we're going to explain here in a little bit in a way that's easier to understand. But in a good program, you would include all three movements of those joints. Now, the last thing I think we want to talk about before getting into actually building your program is the role genetics play when it comes to growing your glutes and even the shape of your glutes, mm. which I'm curious if when you looked on social media, 
if you found a lot of people talking about this aspect of glutes as well, the genetic aspect, because this is something I don't see talked about quite as much. I see a lot of girls talk about whether or not they're quad dominant or glute dominant. So some are more mm. like going to put on more mass in their quads versus their glutes and vice versa. I know that that's like a huge topic of conversation with yeah. especially gym girls. Like I'm going every like quad dominant girl has their glute dominant best friend. And it's like they just put on a lot more mass in their glutes versus their quads. But that's the extent to which I hear it talked about. So it doesn't do it complete justice in understanding how large of a role genetics actually play in, in your glute development. I know exactly what you're talking about. I think I've seen that exact meme. When I played volleyball, because you're working your quads you're sprinting and all, the time. all the time. Yeah. So, my, oh my goodness, it's insane. I wish I could pull up a picture. I probably have some how big my quads were. Just and I was trunks. also like, it made me so much better at what I was doing. So I had different goals then, but yeah. it's so funny how real it is. That might be the extent of what I see it talked about for the most part, but there's just, there's no getting around it. Genetics are one of the most important variables when it comes to improving strength and building muscle overall, but especially when it comes to developing your glutes mm -hmm. and not just how you grow and build them, but how they look aesthetically. And this is more geared towards, I think, females too, because the aesthetic of glutes that people usually chase isn't just the muscle aspect, but it's also where body fat distribution has a pretty big role where mm -hmm. if a female has great glute genetics, they could have very little muscle, but still have what appears as great glutes. Uh, where can I say, I'm going to say something real quick. Cause yeah. <laughs> sorry, I have to say a fat ass is a real thing. And I don't think a lot of girls like, do, like a lot of them will say like this, I don't train this. I just have literally have a fat ass. Like I put on more fat <laughs> in my butt. Yeah. And if they trained it, obviously like it would be a little bit more toned, but like that is a real thing. Absolutely. Because it's where it's where people tend to store body fat more and more. And usually the the stubborn body fat areas for people are usually more annoying, like the lower part of your core or your love handles or under your arms, where it's not aesthetically pleasing, where for females, if you tend to store body fat in your glutes and in the right areas, it can be a great thing. And, and my next think, life. And that's the hard part where it's not to discourage, but it's very challenging if you don't have those genetics. Mm -hmm. You have to be really intentional to actually develop really good glutes if you're not born with those great glute genetics. It's not impossible whatsoever, but you have to work a lot harder because we know muscles a lot harder to build than storing or moving fat. We know that. So if that's what you have to rely on 100% rather than having 80, 90% of it taken care of by fat distribution, it's a lot more challenging. But we're going to talk about exactly how to get around that because it's not going to prevent anybody from getting great glutes. But it comes down to two main factors of genetics, the growing the glutes part. One is going to be your skeletal anatomy or how your bones are built. And the other is how your body responds to resistance training, which is going to be different for everybody. Now, when it comes to skeletal anatomy, this is going to be mostly what influences the appearance or the shape of your glutes. And just for a friendly reminder, you can modify the appearance of your glutes by adding muscle and losing body fat, but you can't change your bone structure. That's something we have to understand, especially I know I talk about on like social media, the appearance of hip dips, big component that people try and change a lot, but that's one of those things that you can't really change because it's due to your bone structure, not necessarily muscle, but for another example, depending on how wide or narrow your ilium bones are, how long your femoral necks are, how pronounced the bony protrusions off the top of your femurs are, your glutes can appear to either have more of a square or round look compared to a more heart or V-shaped look. That's more due to bone structure. Some people also have more outward facing curves, giving a more, again, for normal people part, like the bubble look. The bubble mm. look is from those more outward facing curves, while other have more inward indentations on the inside of their hip bones, which give more of that hip dip look to make those more prevalent. Yeah. And I see so many stupid hip dip workouts on the internet. I've made clips on them all the time. One, don't fall for that because it's, it's a hollow area created by your pelvis and your femur. So understand that first. You can't change a hollow area because one, there's no muscle there to build in between. And you can't spot reduce body fat anywhere. You can't choose where to lose fat. And two, uh, this is something, I don't know if it's maybe you saw on the female side of things. Guys don't care. Like 
usually enjoy them. Like in the 80s and 90s, every female superhero had hip dips because the stronger your glutes are and the more well-developed and the lower your body fat percentage is, the more anatomically certain it is that you will have hip dips. Every oh. human will have hip dips at a certain point if you get leaner and develop your glutes. It's a strength trait, not a yeah. bad thing. No, no, not liking hip dips or them not being attractive was a unrealistic beauty standard set by women. It's not a real thing. It's more recent, this insecurity about hip dips. Oh, yeah. That it was cr created by women as this new thing that is undesirable and we have to get rid of. It's so strange. It's the sa same thing as like a thigh gap, like yeah. trying to train to get a thigh gap or your thighs not touching one that has it entirely everything to do with your anatomy, your hip structure, how wide set you your hips are. You can't just change that. And two, yeah. who said that that was undesirable for thighs to touch? Like what? It's yeah. so weird. Have you heard the trend right now going on called legging legs? I've seen it, but I didn't. It's one of those things that I see and then scroll past because it, it's something that requires more effort to look into to find out what it is. Yeah. It's not apparent. So I just skip it. It's the modernized version of wanting a thigh gap. It's essentially oh. wearing leggings and your legs not touching at all. Uh, this is new to me. Legging legs. I'm like, what? What are we doing, guys? That's so strange. Like, <laughs> Put on it leggings is... if you have legs and now you have legging legs. What are you talking about? That they shouldn't it's, touch? Uh, it, yeah. <laughs> the anatomy things are crazy. The hip tips are crazy to me because it's like if you ask, if it's just an appearance thing, if you ask 99% of guys, they're like, yeah, I love them. Like they're cool. No, like no, nothing if you do or don't have them, but they're not a bad thing, which yeah. kills me. But this whole thing leads to a really good point. And that's especially when you look at like who to trust and where to go for glute information online is if you have a good butt, which genetically is very possible for you just to be pretty much born with. And especially with how leggings work these days, it's crazy. Like a good pair of Lululemons or aloe or something else. If you have a decent amount of mass in your glutes and a good pair of leggings, you look like you could be a glute expert. And a lot yeah. of people that just throw those on who really haven't spent much time in the gym or just do mini band workouts, but they just appear like they have great glutes, will start selling their glute program or they'll become a glute expert. And it's like, well, you didn't necessarily do this to build those. You just kind of do that. And that's also what you already have. And again, even if someone has built their own glute growth and you see a before and after, which I think is speaks volumes over just having a good glute set up in the first place. Again, that's just what worked for one person, not what works for everybody else. Because especially when we get into the anatomy part of things, that's where exercise choice and rep schemes and all these things really, really matter. Like the biofeedback that require, like that are, is really required in a good training program matters. It really, really matters. We're going to look through all this and we're going to put these together, but later we're going to get into the four major anatomical differences when we're choosing exercise choice and rep schemes and things like that. But the four main points of things are one, the angle and depth of your hip socket, your femur length or how long that upper leg bone is. I know that's more commonly talked about how much natural curve you have in your spine and then your pelvic or hip width. Those four things are really going to determine what exercises you should choose, what rep ranges, the range of motion, the volume, a lot of different things that go into it. So now we're going to talk about part two how to build the perfect loop program from choosing the right exercises to how to structure each day of the week, really just optimizing it for your goals. So we're going to break this piece by piece, right? We're going to step into it step by step. Cause first, before we talk about the exercise choice, we have to understand how any muscle grows and gets stronger period, not just your glutes, any muscle, because if our goal is to grow our glutes, we need to understand how to grow muscle period. Okay, so when a muscle grows and gets bigger, it's called hypertrophy, a word that we're probably going to use a lot that we have before, but that's what hypertrophy means. It's just when a muscle is getting bigger in size. Doesn't necessarily mean strength, but just size. But there are three main mechanisms of hypertrophy for any muscle, including your glutes. One is mechanical tension. Two is muscle damage. And three is metabolic stress. Those three things are the main mechanisms for growing any muscle in your body. And this sounds confusing, but we're going to make it really, really simple. Mechanical tension is the single most important variable responsible for roughly 80 plus percent of your growth. And that's why lifting heavy weights is, I don't want to say 100% needed to grow great glutes, but I, I've never really seen someone do it without. 
like you got to lift heavy weights, like just cutting it with mini bands, which have their place in a program, isn't going to cut it. So think of mechanical tension. Like when you lift heavy weights, your muscles experience this type of tension that's similar to a rubber band being stretched. And that leads to strong contractions as the muscle works hard to handle the load you put on it. This is what mechanical tension is. But there's two main ways that you put tension on a muscle, passive and active tension, passive and active. Passive tension is like when you put tension on a muscle, when it's stretching passively, like performing a hamstring stretch, where active tension is where you put tension on your muscle by flexing or contracting it. Like if you were to flex your biceps, flexing for a picture, which I don't know if you, if you guys don't watch these, Mariana's is like flexing her biceps half the time here. If you're just audibly listening to this, that's all she freaking does. I'm like, your, I'm like, put your freaking sleeves back I can on. show off my new tattoos. Mm. That's what it really is. I got twiggy arms and I'm not, I'm not ashamed of it. It's fine. But when you lift weights correctly and through a full range of motion, these muscles are put under both forms of tension, both passive and action. So that's why lifting weights is usually the best. So the goal here would be to load the muscles with as much tension as you can while they're under both forms of tension. That's mechanical tension. The number one most important thing, which we're going to talk about here more later. The second most. I think matters even more when it comes to growing your glutes is something called metabolic stress, which we've touched on here and there in different episodes, but I would put coupled with mechanical tension in a solid glute training program. But metabolic stress is when you get that feeling, like when you know you're really targeting a muscle, like when you feel the burn or the pump for a movement, when you ever get like a great contraction on any muscle oh, in yeah. your body, glutes is a good mm -hmm. one to think about, but like, holy crap, that felt good. Mm -hmm. A lot of that's going to be pushing metabolic stress or when you get a pump. Now, metabolic stress is brought on by a number of different things, which we're going to make simple again after this. But hypoxia is one of them or just a lack of oxygen to the cells. The blockage of veins from the muscle contractions preventing blood from escaping the muscle. The buildup of metabolic byproducts like lactate is one of them. And blood pooling from that pump. So metabolic stress is brought on by a number of different things. It's why this is, I don't know if this is my ADHD kicking in. I, do you ever have memories of things? And you're like, how come I chose to remember that out of all things? Anyway, I remember learning in school about if you're like marathon runners, when mm. they're training, they'll train at high altitude for marathons, especially ultra marathon runners, which is just insane. I don't even know how much an ultra is, but they'll train at high altitude because of the hypoxia, which is the lack of oxygen to your cells. And it's yeah. a type of that metabolic metabolic stress that makes your performance so much better when you're training at altitude. So not high altitude, but at altitude, but it's yeah, a type I of remember, metabolic stress that they put themselves through. I remember living in Colorado growing up, it would always make like the no local news headlines that Lance Armstrong, when he was going for his runs before he got caught using steroids, mm -hmm. would go up to Boulder because it's, you know, anywhere, from, I think it's like six to 8,000 feet above sea level. Like Denver's yeah. a mile above, so about 5,200 feet above sea level, but Boulder's even more up in the flat irons and he would go up and train there. And a lot of athletes would just go up and train there for weeks and months on end because it would help their body adjust to that. So when they go back down to yeah. regular altitude, whenever I go back home now to visit family and I work out, I am gassed because of yeah. the lack of oxygen. It cracks me up. But yeah. now they have altitude tents, which literally, I don't even know if that's what they're called. Are they called altitude? Tent? I don't know. They're so expensive, but it yeah. makes it so you can. I've seen those and then altitude. the altitude masks. Yeah. where people train in, even though from what I've read research wise, if you're They're just using as... the masks, it's not really effective because you're only limiting your oxygen during your workout Yeah, and not 24 seven. Like if you were actually living at altitude, mm -hmm. but that's besides the point. We're not telling Sorry, you. Sorry. That was a random side note that I just <laughs> but said. Interesting. <laughs> but, but we're not trying to, we're not saying move to altitude to get better glutes. No, no, but why I think metabolic stress is even more important when we're talking about glute training more than any other body part is because of the pump, which anyone who gets a great glute pump, one, it feels good. Like you're like, okay, this looks dope. I'm a dude. I've taken a glute selfie because of a glute pump before. So obviously Yo, some that's girls are crazy. Their before and after of their, oh, it's insane. It's insane. But not just for the aesthetic purposes, but here's one thing we were talking about when we talked about the science of the pump in a different episode is that when your muscles are swollen from metabolic stress, you can feel the muscle contraction so much better when you are doing the movement. This is why activation exercises are so important in glute training is because it helps you feel the muscle better. So it's not that the metabolic stress directly will 10 X your glute growth, 
But when you place it and put it right in the right pieces of your program with activation things and how we set it up in hours, you can lift and get so much better contractions on bigger movements like hip thrusts, like squats, like leg press, like Bulgarians, whatever, allowing you to get such a better contraction. That's the mechanical tension aspect. What leads to 80% mm -hmm. of growth, you can get so much more out of that if you use metabolic stress correctly than if you don't. And that's why I think in a great glute program, you have specific movements that are there intentionally for the pump. So these things include really just anything that is higher rep, faster repetitions, shorter rest periods, partial reps, things that are just really there to activate the muscle. Now, the third and final mechanism behind growth is muscle damage, which is the literal micro tears that are caused by lifting heavy weights. And I know some people still tend to believe that this is what causes muscle growth, period. This is more like old school thinking. The more you can physically break down your muscle, the better, which we talked about in that full body, the last training program, we did that full body episode in the science of full body training. It, it contributes so little to muscle growth. And honestly, it more inhibits you from training at your absolute best through the week. If you are just so freaking sore where this is where like doms or soreness usually comes from, all it's really going to do is inhibit your body from doing more total work throughout the week for the most part. So isn't I would say in glute just, training, it's the least important. Isn't like those, the, aren't those micro tears just what's happening when you're actually strength training? That's just what is happening to your muscles. It doesn't mean that they're growing. It's just this. Yeah. Like, like, again, what that's what's happening. happening. It's what's happening while you're lifting weights. They do yeah. contribute to muscle growth, but again, such a small yeah. piece. And especially when we talk about glute training, and we talked a lot about training frequency or how many days per week in that full body episode. And we'll talk more about this when we talk about how many days per week you want to train your glutes. But usually higher frequency is better because your muscle can really fully recover. I mean, if you're brand new within two days, if you're advanced training within like a day, day and a half sometimes. So if you're only training your glutes one time per week, you're just leaving so much room on the table where you could be maxing out your growth. And that's where I think the, the frequency problem comes from. So we'll talk about that, but muscle damage is going to lead the least to muscle growth there. But the two main mechanisms are that mechanical tension, loading heavier weights on your muscle, and then metabolic stress. But none of this matters without that little thing called progressive overload, which we'll link the full episode we did on that one in the show notes down below, because we could talk for another hour about that. Mm -hmm. But progressive overload, think of it as like a video game where as you get stronger, you need to increase the challenge if you want to keep growing. Because just like in the game, if you stay at the same level, you're never going to get any better. So to explain it on that more basic level, your muscle won't grow or have a reason to grow or get stronger unless you're continually making it work harder than it's used to. By increasing the weight you're lifting, increasing the sets or reps or tempo, there's dozens of different ways that you can implement progressive overload. But that is one piece that you absolutely need. And we have that full episode on it for a reason. But now that we understand what causes a muscle to grow, let's talk about setting up your week, right? So the, the, the meat and potatoes. I hate that saying. I don't know why I said it. I apologize. The meat that. and potatoes. It just the, reminds me of like my professors would say it. It's like, yeah, like I don't 90 know. 90-year-old dudes that are weird. That's what it reminds you of. The meat and potatoes. Give me that good stuff. So more specifically, let's talk about how often how much and how hard to train the glutes before choosing our right exercises. So let's start with the frequency conversation because this is a hot topic of debate. Frequency just meaning how many days per week you should be training your glutes. And this is where it's not a black and white answer. It's why I love podcasts because we can really break it down. There's not a best number of days to train your glutes. A lot of factors go into it, like your exercise choice. For example, exercises like barbell back squats and deadlifts and Bulgarian squats, they beat you up a lot more than exercises <laughs> like a hip thrust. They cause a lot more muscle damage, which takes longer to recover from. So if your program is dominated by these bigger movements like squats, deadlifts, Bulgarians, you probably can only get away with training them like once to twice per week. And that's really it. Where if you at least take this into mind, you could probably get away with training up to three or four, sometimes even five times a week. Where Again, our program set up to three days because I think for most people, that's the best is a three-day frequency status, but it's something that you got to take into account. 
if you're more of a power lifter, a crossfitter, someone who loves doing movements like barbell back squats or deadlifts, <laughs> it's something that you should probably consider. Why and would you so, even want to do, oh my goodness, I'm like, what? the days I do Bulgarian split squats, it's, it's like I'm seeing red and I, why would you want to? <laughs> Listen, I'm with you, but things. some people love I know. the pain. Like they love yeah. the pain. Like I've got some clients who will put them in. And at the end of each training block, it's just like, okay, what do we really have the most fun with? What do we enjoy? And it's like, Bulgarians were the hardest, but I loved it the most because it beat the literal crap out of me. I, I love Bulgarians. And we're going to talk about those here in a little bit, specifically that movement, but you can make amazing progress training your glutes anywhere from two to five days per week. Mm -hmm. If everything else in between is set up five days a week and two days a week looks very, very different in what goes into each of those workouts. But that's the frequency answer. I think for most people training three times per week and, and managing their volume and which exercises they're doing usually works best. But for someone who's more advanced, they might need something like four or five days. And I mean advanced where you've been training, not just working out, but training hard for like five to 10 years plus. So for most people, I think three days is a good cap to do things. Okay. This is why we chose three days in our upper lower split. But before we pick specific exercises, we have to talk about something called training volume, where this is the most, I think, important thing that you could be paying attention to if you're going from like that beginner novice stage into more intermediate advanced territory where you're paying more attention to your training. I think the first thing that you could do is start by simply paying attention to your training volume or more simply said, how many sets on a muscle group you're doing each week. I think that's one of the first things that you could pay attention to. That's not super hard to grasp at first, but has so much to do with your progress, right? Like I think that's mm -hmm. an easy barrier to entry, lowest hanging fruit. And it's one that it took me the longest to catch on to. I feel like when I first started working out, like that was something that took a while to click with me with how important it is, but also it is easy to check off the box to make sure you're doing that. And it's such a core principle, but for some reason, I just took me a while to pay attention yeah. to it. Yeah, it matters. Like your total training volume is one of the most, the one of the biggest predictors of overall progress. So it's usually the best thing that you want to start paying attention to. So what do I mean by how many sets per week you're performing on each muscle group? An example, if you do three sets of three glute exercises on two workouts per week, that would be 18 total sets on glutes that week. That would be the number that matters, 18. That's the number that you'd want to track. So we want to set goals for how many total sets on your glutes you want to be training per week. So given this, I think too many people, and this is what I was talking about when we initially recorded this before it got erased, RIP, but I think your experience level should determine how many sets you're aiming for a lot more than just a lot of people give it a blanket. Something that I've done in the past, just saying, you know what, 10 to 20 hard sets per week and you're golden, no matter who you mm -hmm. are. 10 to 20 hard sets. Obviously, if you're starting out, starting closer to 10, more advanced, closer to 20. But I think when it comes to glutes, along with other muscles like your triceps, your lats, and sometimes your shoulders, they tend to respond to a little bit higher training volume than others. Since progressive overload really just means more, if you're a beginner and only do five sets per week, then 10 sets honestly would give you phenomenal growth. Where if you're advanced and you've been training for five plus years doing 20 to 30 sets and you just started doing 10 sets per week, that would not be anywhere near enough to signal growth. So just saying 10 sets is enough to do X, Y, or Z. It's, I think it's a lazy answer. I think a good place to aim is if you're a beginner, meaning you've lifted less than a year, lifted less than a year, you're just getting into it. Aiming between as little as six to 12 hard sets per week is a good place to start, start. six to 12 hard sets. And that is shockingly low for a lot of people because so many I've, I've shopped around and looked at glute training programs from coaches online. And sometimes it's almost like they just throw as many glute exercises as they can remember in their head on paper. And they're doing like 40, 50 sets of glutes. And it's like, why, why it's for someone, especially starting out, it's like, you don't need that. It's usually going to be too much and be what gets in the way of you growing in the first place. So for beginners, aiming between six and 12 hard sets is usually a great place and plenty enough to start. And for those who are just starting out thinking that you need more than that, keep in mind that lifting and growing, this is going to be several year process for the most part, right? Like for the rest of your life really is when you are changing and lifting weights. Progressive overload means more. 
So if you start out doing the most, you can't keep increasing from there. Like there, there's a ceiling that you're going to hit. So that's where I want to say with people getting more comfortable working on their intensity and how hard they're working, how heavy they're lifting, how close to failure they're working at lower set counts for intermediate lifters. So people who've been lifting between let's say two and five years, aiming between 12 and 24 hard sets is a good place to aim. So 12 and 24 hard sets on your glutes where for more advanced lifters. And again, I think if you surveyed most people at the gym, more people would rate themselves as advanced than I think are actually advanced. Mm -hmm. Advanced is people who have been training hard, training, meaning following a program, following progressive overload, not just in the gym for five plus years, but training hard and progressing for five plus years. That's where between upwards of even 24 to 40 hard sets is probably what it's going to take to see significant, significantly more growth when it comes to glutes. And just for reference, when I say hard sets, last piece here before we choose exercises, I'm talking about sets that you're using a weight that brings you within about zero to three reps of failure, or else really you're just not going to stimulate your glutes in a way that will signal growth. That's really it. So if you're doing a leg press, but you're doing, you know, 80 pounds for 10 reps, honestly, if you took that 80 pounds to failure and you could do like 20 reps, but you're stopping just at 10, it's not going to be enough to really signal growth for the most part. So you got to be working heavy. And I will just say this add on note, look at your legs. If you're listening to this right now, your legs are freaking massive. This is what bothers me the most is when I see people in the gym lifting like five, 10, 15 pound dumbbells for any leg exercise, RDLs, squats, anything, your legs are half of your body. Half of your body is stronger than a 15 pound dumbbell. Like you can move some serious weight. It's cool my legs are more than half of my body. It's crazy. I'm like, <laughs> it it's, in some cases they are, but it's like your legs are massive. They can handle big weights. It's cool if you want to start light to get comfortable with the movements, a hundred percent. But once you get comfortable with it, challenge yourself to move forward because that's where growth is really going to come from. Yeah. Now let's talk about choosing the right exercises. First things first. We got to understand that there's no such thing as a best exercise. I'll quote unquote that best exercise for any muscle. So if someone or someone online keeps saying that you absolutely need this, if you want to grow your glutes, if it's hip thrust, Bulgarians, whatever, you don't need any one exercise to grow phenomenal glutes or to grow any muscle group the best you absolutely can. You don't need any one exercise. This example that we talk about before is actually a study that Brett Contreras self-funded comparing the barbell hip thrust to barbell back squat, looking at specifically glute growth. I mean, Brett Contreras put up $40,000 of his own money. How much money goes into a study? If you have to self-fund a study, holy shit. Oh, it's insane. So much money. It's, that is so in, much money. He put in $40,000 of his own money along with the co-author who did it with him, another $40,000 just to compare hip thrusts and squats. They couldn't even afford to do a third group that did a combination of both hip thrusts and mm -hmm. squats because that would have been another $40,000 with how much it really cost. And it was a nine week trial. That's it. Like research yeah. is freaking expensive, but they wanted to really see like, okay, hip thrusts get nearly two times as much glute activation compared to squats when you hook them up to EMG or electromyography. So you can track almost two times better doing a hip thrust, then you do a squat. And most people do think that the more you feel an exercise, the better it is for growth. A lot of people, Brett even said going into this study, that's what he expected. Mm -hmm. But when you look at the end of the trial, each exercise had nearly identical growth in every section and subsection of your glutes, the upper, the mid, the lower glute max, the glute med, the glute min, they all grew the exact same in the group who was only doing squats and the group who was only doing hip thrusts, mm. which kind of shocked a lot of people because how many, this is what annoys me the most on TikTok or Instagram now is like the optimal trainers who are like, well, you get 62% yeah. activation when doing it from this angle, then 52% up here. So this is suboptimal and you should never do it. It's like, that's not the only thing that matters. It matters, yeah. but it's not the only thing that matters. They grow in the exact same way. And I think arguably two main things are what my brain thought of when seeing the results of this is one, squats put a lot more tension or a lot more weight on the glutes in a stretched position. 
than the hip thrust where all the weight is at the very top in the contracted position. And we know that the stretch position of really any exercise is arguably the most important for muscle growth. So mm -hmm. squats put the most tension on at the bottom when your glute is stretched, where hip thrusts at the top when it's contracted. And then two, which I guess these two don't really compare in this manner, but how easily you can progressively overload an exercise is one of the most important things you can take into account. This might be just because I enjoy compound movements more like bench press, back squats, deadlifts. I enjoy those a little bit more. Yes. So this might be a little bias, but why I'm a big fan of adding barbell training into your programs is because barbell training is easily the simplest form of training that you can progressively overload compared to machines, compared to dumbbells, compared to anything else. You can add more weight and increase weight quicker and faster when doing barbell movements because you're using so many different muscle groups than if you do isolated movements like a leg press or mm -hmm. things like that. So I think a few things go into it, but here's how you really choose. Cause at this point you're probably like, okay, bro, this is more confusing than when we started. Like which exercises do I need to do? So here's how we're going to choose the right exercises. Like we talked about before, your glutes move your hip joints in three major ways, hip extension, hip external rotation, and hip abduction. Brett Contreras coined the rule of thirds when it comes to glute training. This is in our program, but this is in, I think any optimal glute training program is where about a third of your exercises in a glute workout are going to come from horizontal exercises where your body's more horizontal to the ground. So like a hip thrust, a glute bridge, a hyperextension. One to two of your exercises should be coming from a vertical position where your body is up and down like squats or deadlifts. And then one or two in each workout should be rotary exercises like hip abduction or external rotations. So if you're doing about a third of volume from each of those, you're going to be targeting them from all possible angles that you can. And this is where I think we're going to talk about how to optimize which exercise is best based on your anatomy. So bear with me real quick, but your hip structure, your femur length, your spinal curve, all these things that make a difference. Let's talk about hip structure first, or the angle and depth of your hip socket, which can vary a lot between people. The biggest difference here is I think you see men versus women. Women naturally have wider set hips, but there's going to be men who have wider set hips than some women and some women who have narrower set hips than some men. This is a you basis, not a male versus female basis. But what this specifically does is changes the range of motion and stability in the hip joint a ton, a ton. The wider your hips are set, usually the much better control, stability, and range of motion you're going to have in movements like squatting, specifically deep squatting. This is absolutely massive. So someone with wider set hips is going to thrive more in deep exercises like a barbell back squat compared to someone with narrower set hips who might really want to more choose a leg press, a Bulgarian option, something where their hips aren't needing to open up as much. Your femur length is a massive one. I'm this is just how long femur. I'm a long femur, bro. Do you have a long, you have long femurs too, don't you? I want to go measure it. <laughs> I want to go get a tape <laughs> can we, measure. Can we take a quick pause? Can we get the keep, ruler? No, out? keep talking. I'm measure. going to get a tape. I'm literally going to get a tape measure. All right. So mm -hmm. she goes and gets the tape measure. We're going to talk about femur length. Because if you have longer femurs compared to your torso, you're probably going to struggle with movements like conventional squats or deadlifts because your femur is going to make you lean a lot more forward when you go down, which is going to strain your lower back more than your glutes, which you want. So if you have longer femurs, doing sumo deadlifts or Bulgarian split squats are going to be much more effective, allowing you to maintain a more upright posture compared to doing a conventional barbell back squat. Think about a Bulgarian split squat where your chest can stay a lot more upright and neutral compared to a barbell back squat, which is going to push you down. And I don't want to say if you have long femurs, you can't do barbell back squats. Look at Lane Norton. I think he actually has a world record for barbell back squat in powerlifting competition. He's got some of the longest femurs in the game. So that doesn't stop you from doing anything. But if your goal is not to set a world record powerlifting competition and you want more comfort and ease in your training, which is going to help you progress more, be more consistent, feel better during your training. It's something you want to take into account. For example, barbell back squats, I love them, but if my goal is simply to grow my glutes, since I have longer femurs, I always opt for the Bulgarian option or a sumo deadlift, something like that, that lets me keep an upright or natural spot. What you got for us? <laughs> I just measured my femur. They're around two feet. Yeah. Two feet. Like tw it was like 22 Dang. inches. So I, get I guess, no, 22 inches. 
But my legs are, uh, I have a, what is my, what is my inseam? 38 inches. What's an inseam? It's your hip down, like, so your, your pant length. If you think oh, about like. that's what that is? That, that's your in, inseam. It's your hip all the way down oh. to your, like, bottom of your foot. So, hmm. yeah, I have a 38 inch inseam, which is how. I feel like yours would be longer. I feel like mine's like 40. No, no, it's definitely not. Like they don't make 38 inches in stores. Like the tallest typically any store is like, especially I buy my boyfriend's pants and he's 6'5". The tallest they typically go up to is like 36 inches. Jack's 6'5"? Yeah. He's like How six, did I not know this about Four him? and a half. He's really tall. Gosh dang. Yeah. <laughs> well, Tony knows absolutely nothing about clothing measurements. I'm going to measure mine right after that. But that's where we were talking about different exercises can really benefit or help you get a lot more out of your training. The third big one that you want to look at is your spine curvature or the natural curve of your lower back where individuals with excessive anterior pelvic tilt or more curve in their lower back, they're going to find that focusing on exercises that don't exacerbate this tilt like deadlifts can better engage the glutes without putting excess strain on your lower back. So that's where you want to take those things into account where if you're doing a conventional deadlift and you have a lot of natural curve in your spine, that's going to exacerbate or put a lot more tension on your spine through the movement. It might be better to avoid and sub those out with something different. So what we're going to do is follow the rule of thirds. When you're choosing exercises, you want to choose one to two horizontal, one to two vertical, and one to two rotary or abduction movements. And we're going to talk about how exercises that are best for metabolic stress or activation really fit in this because especially when talking about your glute med and your glute min, that upper outside part of your glute, if that's where you're really looking to grow, which a lot of people are, it's super helpful to do activation exercises like seven way hips, for example, or banded exercises that light those up. That's not going to apply a lot of mechanical tension on those. That's not going to get them to grow, but it's going to get that glute me, glute min to fire up and activate. So when you're doing a squat, when you're doing a hip thrust, those are more active. You're getting better contractions during those. And that's where the attention is applied. So this is where it's kind of like a, an indirect, not quite direct way of how these grow. So mm -hmm. all of these are good choices as long as they take the glutes through a good range of motion, allow you to place a lot of tension on them, and they play a role in your overall program. So first talking about horizontal glute exercise. This just means when you are fighting gravity, pulling the glutes from straight back. So mainly when your body is horizontal to the ground, the most common movement here is the barbell hip thrust, which is going to be the most important to add for horizontal movements. These can be the standard American barbell hip thrust, dumbbell hip thrust, banded hip thrust, the hip thrust machine, which if your gym has one of those, does yours have one? I love, love the hip thrust machine over barbell hip thrust. No, we don't have one. Oh, some, like some of the machines yeah. are really good. I think it's depending on your anatomy, how well it's lined up with that. But so many times you can get such a better contraction and just it's so much easier to set up a machine than it is to get the barbell out, to roll everything out. But whatever you have, some sort of hip thrusting movement, a B stance hip thrust, a deficit hip thrust, a glute bridge, which is just your back on the ground, or something that doesn't require weight on your hips is like a 45 degree hyperextension, which is one of my favorite movements to add in if you can't hip thrust. Because one, you're either holding no weight to little weight, it's putting so little weight on your back and just causes so little muscle damage, but allows you to target your glutes so freaking well if you learn how to do them right. And one of my favorites overall is incorporating mini bands around your knees doing a banded barbell hip thrust because not only is that going to be phenomenal at targeting all subdivisions of your glute max, but that band and forcing you to drive your knees outward is going to really recruit your glute med and min. So you can get the most out of those movements by just slightly adding a band on to that movement. When we talk about vertical glute exercises, this can be anywhere from a squatting movement. So barbell back squats, Smith machine squats, wide stance leg press, Bulgarian split squats, single leg leg press, which is a great option if you don't love Bulgarian split squats, to deadlifting movements, either conventional or sumo, which sumo does for most people have a little bit better glute activation, but still both phenomenal posterior chain or back of your entire body exercises. Mm -hmm. You have Romanian deadlifts or RDLs, which give a much better stretch on the glute. You can do that with a barbell or a dumbbell. I'll say this too. 
RDLs are tough for me doing them standard. I have a very long spine and back. It's very hard for me to do a barbell or dumbbell RDL and feel them in my glutes. It's all hamstrings and back for me. Same. And same. doing that, a lot of people struggle that way. They're like, everyone says yeah. this is the best glute building exercise and they do it. And they're like, I feel this everywhere, but my glutes. This is what saved me is doing a B stance RDL or a bench B stance. If you don't know what B stance is, I don't know if I could audibly explain to you what it is in a way that makes sense, but it's essentially where you alter your stance a little bit, one foot forward, one foot back. So you're targeting yeah. one at a time, jujulate, just jujulate. Or trap bar deadlifts would be another phenomenal deadlifting movement in there. Lunges are another phenomenal vertical glute exercise. So forward leaning or reverse dumbbell lunges, elevated Smith machine lunges, which that movement by far, we have that in our program, the elevated Smith machine lunge is going to give you the best possible stretch because what that deficit does is essentially where you're doing a lunge, but where your front foot is on a platform a few inches off the ground. You could use a weight, a bench, a step, whatever. But what that does is it allows you to go past what's normally possible for range of motion in a lunge. And it puts such a good stretch on your glute, better than any other exercise that I've seen. So I love them. Oh, they're brutal, but they're so freaking great for them. Curtsy lunges, where you're back, dropping your back foot back and across your body. Step ups, where you're leaning forward or into it at the hips. And that's where whenever you're doing like a lunging or stepping motion, if you want to make it more glute dominant, you want to like lean forward at the hips, really putting a, a stretch on your glute right there. So especially if you're someone doing Bulgarians, one of the biggest problems I see with that movement is when people step too far away from the bench because they're afraid of their knee going over their toe. But really, if you're doing it correctly, your foot's pretty dang close to the bench that you're going on, mm -hmm. allowing you to put so much more pressure on your glutes than your hamstrings, your quads, anything else. Rotary and abduction exercises, I would say outside of the machine abduction, that's usually the, the best one that you can put a heavy load on your glute need. But these rotary and abduction exercises like lateral band walks, seated abduction, cable kickbacks, landmine rotations, things like that usually can be used as activation exercises or metabolic stress pump exercises and do a really, really good job. A couple other activation or metabolic stress exercises to either put before you train your glutes heavy to really fire them up or even at the end of your glute workout or after a set of something heavy to really completely exhaust them are things like frog thrusters, seven-way hips, sideline clam cells, banded glute bridges, fire hydrants, single leg glute bridges. Stuff like that can be phenomenal because mm -hmm. I know a lot of people hate frog thrusters. And uh -huh. this is what we talked about when we had that conversation where I, I didn't know why people hated activation exercises. People mm -hmm. like they're bull crap. They don't do anything. They don't do this. If you just do activation exercises, no, you're not going to grow anything, but that's not what they're there for. It's in the name. They're activation exercises. They're there to activate a muscle before you go use it in something bigger. Yeah. Frog like thrusters is phenomenal for you see, oh my gosh, they're activation exercises, but you see all over YouTube and influencers selling their booty workouts. It's just like booty band workout or no equipment workout to grow your glutes. Yes. And how they're marketed and advertised is so incorrect. They're not for growth, but that's how you'll see like the 10 minute like peach workout, whatever. And it not a single way is involved. And it's not to say that these types of exercises don't have a purpose, but what influencers sell them as is glute growth. And you're not going to get any growth from this, but they're still great. So that's why they get a really bad rep. Yeah. yeah I hate it. I didn't, I didn't get that at the time. I was, that's what I was asking you last time when we first recorded this. I was like, why do people hate them? And that's exactly it is you'll buy these programs and it's all activation, yeah. all activation, no heavy weights, no nothing. And that's the reason why they don't directly, but they'll indirectly lead to a lot more growth. Add the seven way hips to your next leg day. Even if you're not, if it's on a glute day, but leg day then DM me with how it goes. That's my favorite thing is when people first do seven way hips, just look it up. It's Ryan Flaherty's giving the demo on YouTube, but ideally in choosing exercises, again, you would choose one to two of each of those from the rotary abduction, horizontal and vertical planes you would choose one to two of them to include in each of your glute days. So for example, like in our th five day split, we have three lower body days that include glutes. They're going to include one to two of each of those exercises in them. 
And <sighs> it's hard to say just with how your individual recovery profile is, how everything else is set up, but take into account how much an exercise beats you up through the week. Like you should not be stacking. I don't say you shouldn't, but you probably shouldn't be stacking massive movements like a barbell hip thrust, a barbell back squat, and a barbell deadlift all on the same day. That's going to beat you up to where you're not going to be able to move for the next few days. But including a rule of thumb is I like to say one bigger compound movement per day. So if you're going to do barbell back squats, you're not doing hip thrusts, you're not doing deadlifts until another day. If you're doing deadlifts, you're not doing hip thrusts, you're not doing anything else. So let's say if you're building a workout and you want to do barbell back squats, cool. That day, your horizontal movement, it won't be a hip thrust. It'll be a 45 degree hyperextension instead. And that's where you just got to, again, think about things from your anatomy. Does a barbell back squat make sense or does a Bulgarian split squat make more sense? Does a B stance RDL or a sumo deadlift make more sense? Think about those things because remember the things that are going to give you the most progress aren't what's quote unquote the most optimal. It's what you can progress the easiest, what you can feel and get the greatest contraction out of, and what you can be consistent with that doesn't cause injury. So if you're always doing RDLs, but it always hurts your lower back and you're not getting a great contraction, I don't care who calls that the most optimal thing in the world. You're not going to progress doing just that. So that's something to think about when it comes to exercise choice. <gasps> no. The fun part, your diet, which this one's tough because it, a lot of people want to grow glutes. So I'm not just speaking to just females because a lot of guys, a lot of girls want to grow their glutes. But if you weren't born with glutes, you're going to have to eat to grow. It's just I've never seen a female make massive change in the size of their glutes without going through at least one proper bulk or building phase. And I want to say building phase more because I think bulk has a bad connotation to it. Bulk seems fluffy, big. People think it's like a dirty bulk, just eating as much as you can. Because you can still grow muscles in a deficit or at maintenance, but you're not going to see massive growth. Yeah. You're not going to see massive growth there. You can, but it's not going to be meaningful or something that it's night and day difference. And we did a whole episode a long time ago on how to set up a proper lean bulk. And I think that's the goal that you'd want to set is at least at maintenance or up to 10% of your calorie intake above maintenance. And just that way you can more guarantee it might take a little longer than if you did a dirty bulk and just shoved as much food in your mouth as you possibly can. But that's the best goal if you want to minimize how much body fat you're storing so you can more guarantee that most of the weight that you're gaining is coming from lean muscle. That's the goal. So aiming for about up to 10% more calories than you burn each day is where you probably want to sit. And what does that mean is if you burn 2,500 calories in a day, you would aim to eat about 2,750. So take 10% of what you burn, add it on top. And that's what it is. Now, how to really nail this down, because giving calorie recommendations of 10% above your maintenance, <laughs> you can use the best calculators on the internet. Like we'll put ours in the link below, which I do think is one of the best. But at the end of the day, it's just a calculator. It is not what your, but there's hundreds of things that influence how many calories your body burns in a day. Even the best calculators out there, ours and others, take into account maybe 10 or 15 things. Maybe. They can't look at your genetics. They can't look at your stress. They can't look at your hormone profile. They can't look at so many different things that also go into how many calories you burn in a day. So one thing that you can do to guarantee that you're not putting on excess fat, and this is one of the most important things you can do, is by taking daily weigh-ins and using an app like Happy Scale, which takes your trending weight, not just your day-to-day -day fluctuations, because your weight's going to go up and down pounds every single day. You're a pound and a half heavier than you were last night two pounds lighter the next day, three pounds heavier the next day. It's not linear. So taking daily weigh-ins, using an app like Happy Scale, and then what you'd want to look for is that you're gaining no more than a quarter to a half a pound per week. Half a pound is more for guys, quarter a pound for females, for the most part, okay? And that's really the only way that you're going to be able to tell whether or not you're gaining weight too fast, because what you might notice is you might increase your calories from, let's say your maintenance is 2,500 to go with that example. And you start eating 2,750, which is 10% more. After the first week, if your scale is just maintaining, if it kind of jumps up and then just stays still, cool. That's your new maintenance calorie. You're not eating in a surplus anymore. If you're eating in a surplus, you would be gaining weight. 
So don't even think about it from just like a 10% above maintenance, anything like this. Find where your body is gaining the right amount of weight on average per week and stick there. And then if it stops or goes too fast, you can pull back, you can increase. And I think this is a hard thing too, because we've talked about this, and this is not a gender thing per se, but on average, I think most females go through life and the goal is to get smaller, not to get bigger. Like this, the goal of the scale, if they use the scale, is to always go down. It's never to go up. And that's the same for a lot of guys, but for a lot of guys, it's also to go up, not down. So it is a psychological mind F if for your entire life, you've been wanting the scale to go down, down, down. Every time you step on it, you're, you're hoping it goes down. No matter how much logic you put behind it, when it goes up, it's going to mess with your head. Even if it's a mm -hmm. good thing, it's going to mess with your head. So continue to use it as data. Try not to attach your feelings to it. We've talked about that on multiple episodes, but that's a mind F, right? Especially, I think, I don't want to say just male and female, but it typically is for more females wanting to see the scale go up. It's weird, right? Oh, yeah. We're taught our entire lives that that's a bad thing. And when you're chasing like the number going down, it goes against all of these preconceived notions you have about what success means in terms of your fitness journey and your appearance. And it's just something we have to really drill into women's heads a lot in the fitness community, a lot more than we're doing, because it's something that holds women back from achieving their goals so often. And it's just not talked about enough, whether it's your glutes, whether it's any muscle growth. A lot of times people are just not eating enough. Yeah. So. Yeah. And it's one of those things that sucks, but it's, if you're just, you can do all the right exercises and try to progress as much as you want in the gym. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to live in a deficit, you're just not going to see meaningful growth. And Who that's why we want to live in a deficit. Yeah. <laughs> this should be an ex exciting news. There like, there oh, you mean be. I don't have to, <laughs> yeah, I get to eat, eat a more. calorie deficit for the rest of my life? Thank God. And look better. Yeah. Cause you see, and I've seen a lot of girls transformations who go from, again, not good starting glute genetics to building really great, well-developed glutes. And sometimes they'll go through it where they go through, I mean, I don't want to call it a dirty bulk, but they will gain 30 mm -hmm. plus pounds sometime and then have to cut back down to do that. That's optional. That's not necessary to do that. I think that's where a lot of girls see like, oh, I don't want to go through a bulk is they think they're going to gain 30, 40 pounds and then have to cut through and be this. You don't have to do that. No, you don't have to do that. If you're consistent and you eat in just a little bit more than you're burning a day, you're not going to gain that much body fat. It's inevitable that you'll gain a little bit here and there, but you're, it's not going to be night and day. You don't have to go through a dedicated crazy bulk phase. You don't have to do that, but just eating slightly above your maintenance, you just got to have. And the final piece on nutrition outside of calorie intake is you got to be giving yourself enough protein. That's what leads to building more muscle, right? We have an awesome protein calculator that we'll link down below too. That's going to give you, a, I think, a better number for you. Anyone that's going to land between about 0.8 and 1.2 grams per pound of lean body mass you have, not body weight, but lean body mass. But that calculator is going to give you a more accurate number for you, a minimum, a maximum, and an optimal goal to aim for. And if you're getting the right amount of calories and you're getting the right amount of protein from a nutritional standpoint, you're giving yourself what you need to grow. Mm -hmm. You are. So those are the two pieces from nutrition. The last piece that we just got to touch on is the recovery principle, which we've done a whole episode on, but things like your sleep, active recovery days, monitoring your stress. It's one of those things where overtraining is a real thing. If you're training glutes six, seven days a week, don't expect to get bigger or stronger. Like you have to remember, you're breaking your glutes down in the gym. You are rebuilding them bigger and better outside of the gym while you're sleeping, while you're resting. So doing things like active recovery day, which is not, this is, again, don't want to be gender specific, but I've had so many girls where it's like, oh, they'll come in and it's like, oh, I'm training four days a week for weights and I take three active recovery days. It's like, oh, what do you do on active recovery? Oh, I do a Barry's boot camp class in the morning. I go on a, 13 mile hike. And then I do this. Like that's not active freaking doing a hit class is not recovery. Aiming for a big step goal, not doing anything to cause more muscle damage, no high intensity cardio, no high intensity weightlifting, stuff like that. Sleep. Mm -hmm. That's when you rebuild. 
So I think in closing, on glutes, that was a pretty pretty good deep dive. Yeah. I think, I think so. all in all, you got to lift heavy enough. You got to hit it from a variety of different exercises. There's no such thing as a best exercise. You need to progressively overload how much weight, how much tension you're putting on your muscle. And you got to eat to support your goals. I think that's what you can garner out of all of this. You don't need to remember the anatomy pieces. You don't need to remember everything else. If you can just follow the rule of thirds in choosing your exercises, push yourself to how much weight you're lifting and continually try and push that further, which again, in like our training program, it's mapped out where every week we're progressively overloading for you. All you have to do is follow each step. But if you're on your own, just making sure that you're holding yourself accountable to push yourself forward as often as you can. And then you got to eat. You got to eat. Yeah. <laughs> and two, I mean, this is a big one, but not just the scale, but take progress photos for yourself on like a weekly or monthly basis. You're not going to see change. FYI, if you're new to building muscle, building muscle, you're not going to see gains over the course of weeks. It's going to be months to sometimes even years. Sometimes it goes into years, but it takes months to see meaningful difference in muscle size, mass, or definition. So don't get so zoomed in on the day-to-day, -day, the week-to-week -week where you get discouraged. Mm -hmm. Trust the process. Keep going bigger and stronger. And you'll build some dope glutes. And you'll get a nice shelf. <laughs> <laughs> Bob the Builder right into a good old shelf. That's the goal. So again, if you want to jump on that training program or any of our others, the upper body focused 12-week split that we're dropping with this one, our full body training routine, our push-pull leg routine, all of that is for free to all premium members. So that's just five bucks in the sign up down below. You also get our weekly AMAs that we come out with every single Friday where we can answer questions about this. But <sighs> that was a good refill. I like that one. I like that one. Y'all have a good one. Take your before and afters. I'm actually doing, I don't know if I announced this on the first recording, not this one. You're doing it? I'm doing the lower body focus, upper lower, which no, I'm are you are you going to get share your before and afters? <laughs> oh, yeah. There's only glutes. The train bloom profile, it's going to be only just glute shots from now on. <laughs> no, it's brutal though. I'm not going to lie. My legs are toasted, which is good. I haven't challenged myself in that way before, but tag along. Let's go on a ride. We'll talk to y'all soon. Everybody in premium, we'll see you Friday. Everybody else, we'll see you next Monday.